In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 119, verses 33 to 48. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me. For I trust in your word and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. For I have helped, hoped in your ordinances. So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty for I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and all glory to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So um, today we are continuing our journey in the uh, commentary on the book of Revelation. We'll be reading today from chapter 19 and it's going to be a very long reading and there'll be only one verse so it's a very very long reading and this verse will take actually two sessions so it'll be today and by the grace of the of the lord our lord jesus christ next friday as well so it is book of revelation chapter 19 and verse 1 after these things i heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying hallelujah salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the lord our god and all glory be to our lord and savior jesus christ forever and ever amen the reason we are taking one verse today because we didn't want to brush through it and we wanted to take our time with it so hopefully it will take us two sessions to talk about this one particular verse in chapter 19. now just a small recap Chapter 18, the entirety of chapter 18 was talking about this woman, the harlot, the mother of harlots. And this woman, we said it's the United Nations, which is founded by the United States of America. And America is this woman because in the Latin language, uh, Amerigo is for a male. It's a name for a male and America is the name for a female. And the one who founded America was Amerigo Vespucci. So they named America after Amerigo, the founder of America, as far as the Latin language is concerned. So they named America as a female. That's why it is America. So this woman is the UN, which is the United States. And chapter 18 was talked all about the punishment, the judgment, the wrath of God coming upon this woman the UN which is slash US and when we look there are three circles my beloved one is the circle of God the other one is the circle of humanity and the other one is the circle of Satan circle of God circle of humanity the circle of Satan any human gathering any human gathering outside God's circle is referred to as adultery any human gathering outside the circle of God where God is excluded is excluded from that gathering that gathering is adulterous and Babylon had a tower of the olden days Babylon had a tower 
And today we see another tower resembling the Tower of Babylon, which is the Tower of the UN in Manhattan, New York. That is the representation of the old Babylon. Now, human in this tower of the UN, they all talk about human rights. God's rights are absent. God's rights are absent. And why the UN is called the mother of harlots? Why is it referred to as the mother of harlots? Because the one who founded the UN or the one who controls the UN is the US. And the US is the women, America, the women. Now, this woman to the eyes of the world is Christian. So instead of this woman being attached to her heavenly groom, which is Christ, who is Christ, this woman became attached to the world. What is adultery? Adultery is somebody is attached to this person. They go and attach themselves to someone else. That is called adultery. Uni United States of America is supposed to be a Christian nation. The, as a Christian nation, who are they supposed to be attached to? The heavenly groom, Christ. They belong to Christ. But this woman went and belonged and attached herself to the world when she left Christ and attached herself to the world became the mother of harlots the adulterous woman yes so adultery is not just that physical act adultery can fall into so many other categories so many other categories now these three circles God's circle human circle Satan circle God's circle I need to be in his holy presence human circle is referred to as adultery when they gather together outside the circle of God. So just like those people of olden days where they got together to build the tower of Babylon, they got together outside the blessings and the presence of God. They went against God and they said, we will do things our way, human rights, not God's rights. So when they got together, they were seen as adulterous people in the eyes of the Lord. That's why he gave them different languages and each one went their way and the tower was never built. And today the UN, nations get together outside the circle of God. So when those nations get together outside the circle of God, they are an adulterous nation. And Satan's circle is referred to as evilness. Humans, adultery, Satan, evil. Now chapter 19, John the Beloved comes to talk about things on the brighter side. You know, chapter 18 is all about negative punishment, judgment, people mourning over the fall of this woman, United States. Chapter 19 is all about positive things. See the problem, if we keep on hearing negative, negative, negative things all the time, we will lose hope. God will never let us always go through negativity. We go through hardships, but those hardships will never last forever. We go through dark times, those dark times will never last forever. We go through tribulations, those tribulations will never last forever. Every time we go through a dark tunnel, God makes sure at the end of the tunnel there is the light. Every time we go through some rough seas, God makes sure that you reach the shores of peace. Every time you're fallen, God will make sure He will put you back on your feet because God will never ever let you lose hope for after every trial, there is comfort. There is comfort. So since chapter 18 is all negative, losing hope, chapter 19, God brings it to give you hope and make you see things in a positive way. Now, chapter 19, the, John the Beloved says, Come, I show you the bride of Christ. So he's showing us the bride of Christ in chapter 19. And when we hear the word bride, automatically we associate that with happiness, joy, laughter, singing, dancing, jumping. Everybody's happy. Have you ever been to a wedding and you sat there grumpy, sad, crying? No, you go there, it's a happy occasion because the bride and the groom make that moment a very joyous and happy one for everyone present there. So now chapter, nine, chapter 18 talks is the woman here in chapter 18 is the harlot. In chapter 19, the woman is the holy one. The woman in chapter 18 is the harlot, the adulterous woman. But the woman in chapter 19 
as the Holy One, the Bride of Christ, the Holy to the Holy. Now, what do we learn from this? Chapter 18, the adulterous woman, the harlot, and chapter 19, the Bride of Christ, the Holy One. The Holy Bible here is teaching us the following. Number one, not everything in this world is bad. Not everything in this world is bad. Number two, not everyone in this world is bad either. There has to be something good. The Lord Jesus always leaves one window open, no matter what. Never shuts it all. You see, sometimes when we go through difficult times, when we are hurt by the closest people to our hearts, what do we say? We judge, and our judgment is actually generalized. There is no one good. They're all bad people. Just because somebody hurt you, that doesn't mean everyone is bad. No. But because we are hurt, we're so weak, we tend to say everyone is bad and everything is ugly. I hate this world. I hate this life. I want to die. Well, so if John was not nice to you, maybe Steve will be. I don't know. If Rachel isn't, maybe Elizabeth is. Or if Elizabeth isn't, maybe Rachel is. I don't know. Not everything is bad and not everyone is bad just because we went through some rough seas. Remember this. There is always something good and someone nice awaiting you. The Lord always keeps one window open if all shut. John the Beloved himself experienced the love of Christ. The world shut its doors in its face from every angle, every corner. But the Lord opened his door in heaven because the Lord will make sure one door or one window is always open because he will never let you lose hope if you let him, if you allow him, he will never let you lose hope no matter what. And I'm sure all of us have experienced this at some stage in our life. Verse 1, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Now, I want you to pay attention, please. It's a, it's a beautiful verse. John the Beloved is saying, after these things, what things? Chapter 18, all the negative, the wrath, the punishment, the judgment, the harlot woman. Man, it's ugly. I feel sick. I want to get out of there. I want to run away from there. He said, after hearing all the negative, I heard, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Chapter 18, the angel is taking John the beloved to show him the harlot woman. To show him the harlot women, he took John to the desert to show him the harlot women. However, when the angel came bringing John, the beloved, to show him the bride of Christ, he took John to heaven. See, when you read the Holy Bible, you need to focus. To show him the harlot women, he took him to the desert. But to show him the bride of Christ, he took John to heaven, not to the desert. Desert below, heaven above is trying to say to us a person who is distant from god is that desert anyone who is distant from god is living below what is below lost fallen when there is a multitude a multitude that means there's a lot of people when there is a multitude do you hear voices or do you hear a voice what would you say come on when there is a multitude do you hear voices or a voice voices isn't it but hang on John the Beloved says, after these things, I heard a voice, one voice, but coming from where? From a great multitude. What are you trying to tell us here, John the Beloved? When multitudes speak, there is voices, not one. He says, no, but I heard one. Why one? Because he said, the angel took me to show me the bride of Christ, and he took me to heaven. Now we're talking about heaven. Chapter 18, talking about the desert, the harlot woman. Chapter 19, talking about heaven. 18, losing hope. 19, gaining hope. Gaining all hope. But John says, I heard one voice coming from a multitude of people. John the Beloved wants to tell us about the way of heaven and the way of earth. He's trying to teach us something. I'll give you an example. Let's say a thousand people enter a church. They enter the church, a one thousand people. These thousand people, each one is unique. Each one has their own identity, their own DNA. Each one's fingerprint is different totally to the one sitting next to them. So, and each one has their own self, which is me, I am. 
So when thousand people enter the church as and each one enters as me, me, me. How many people enter? Thousand. When they speak, how many voices we hear? A thousand. When they think, how many thoughts we can see? A thousand thoughts because each one is unique, individual, totally different, separated to the other. When every one out of these this thousand people enter as me. How many me enter? One thousand me. And each me is different to the other me. So when I speak, I speak differently to the other. So when all of us speak, there is a thousand voices. There is one thousand thoughts. There is one thousand ways. Imagine this on the other hand. A thousand people enter the church and say, not me, but Christ. A thousand people enter and every single one of them says not me but christ when they all talk how many voices will you hear one how many thoughts one how many ways one when every one of them says not me but christ ah, i think you're getting the drift now so john the beloved says and after these things i heard a voice one voice of a great multitude in heaven. He's trying to say to all of us, all those who are in heaven are all one Christ. That's why there was one voice. Because all who are in heaven, they all say, not me, but Christ. So if there is a trillion people in heaven, all of them said, not me, but Christ. That's why they are in heaven. Are you with me? So when that trillion, zillion, number of people all of them said every single one of them said not me but christ when they all spoke christ spoke and how many christ is there one how many voices of christ is there one how many ways of christ is there one i am the way the not a way the way so to christ there is only one way one thought one voice one person And after these things, I heard a loud voice coming from a multitude in heaven. Wow. He's showing us the way of heaven and the way of earth. All people of heaven, their thoughts, their words are not me, but Christ. All they think of is Christ. All they talk about is Christ. That's why it's one voice. And Galatians 2.20, St. Paul puts it so beautifully. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. But how did I come up with this? Because I was crucified with him. What is crucifixion? Dying with the Lord. What is death, biblically speaking? Self-denial. No longer me, it's the Lord. I no longer live for myself, I live for the Lord Jesus. This is heaven. I no longer live for myself, I live for the Lord Jesus. Now the question is, why do we have issues here on earth? Because everybody says me. If it wasn't for me, there wouldn't have been any issues. The mother comes to the daughter, let's go to church. I don't want, I, me, I don't want. I don't care you're my mom, but I don't want. Because the daughter is living for herself, not for her mom. The son is living for himself, not for his dad. The brother is living for himself, not for his sister and vice versa. The husband living for himself, not for his wife and vice versa. That's why nothing happens on earth but problems. Anybody home? Why is the church in turmoil? The ultimate. I know there are other issues, but the ultimate issue is me the church divided because of me not because your theology is not like my theology you know just pack yourself and go home the moment we fix me and your me we'll have Christ as me we won't have a problem we won't have a problem my goodness we won't have a problem um, 
So why do we have issues on earth? Because of me. Heaven has no issues. Earth is full of issues and problems. <laughs> You're going to like this one. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Husband and wife. I love you. <laughs> Both. <laughs> um, husband and wife. The wife comes complaining. The wife comes complaining, maybe to the church. Father, I want to divorce my husband. Why, Habibi? Why, my darling? I've had enough of him. He doesn't listen to me. He doesn't do what I say. I'm not happy. If you notice <laughs> from the word go till the end of her talk or his talk, doesn't matter. From the day, from the word go till they finish their talk, it's all about me. I'm not happy. I'm, I've had enough. That's it. I've decided. I don't care anymore. <laughs> it's all about me. My beloved daughter. Actually, I mentioned this once to one of my beloved daughters when they came whinging and complaining about, <laughs> about her husband. She finished. I let them talk. I give them their space. After they finished, I said, my daughter, I'll ask you a couple of questions. Yeah, father. I said, did you marry this man whom you are complaining and, and, and whinging about? Did you marry this man freely, willingly, with no force, external force, forcing you to marry this man? Yeah, Father, I, I married him. It was my choice. Nobody influenced me. Okay. So now, who's the fool here? Daughter, another question. When you came to marry this Assyrian man with the big nose, did anyone, anyone, did anyone tell you you are marrying a saint? No. So what are you whinging about? You're complaining about someone who is not perfect, exactly like you, not perfect. Because if you were perfect, you would have married someone that would never <laughs> hurt you. And you would have married someone who was a saint, not a sinner. So it looks like your choice was not perfect. So now who are we to blame here? You? Him? It's all about me. Actually, Father, my mother is not happy with him. He comes, the mother-in-law. This is not about marriage. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on. I'll come out of politics and I'll go back to the real deal now. But do you get the drift? Okay. The issue on earth is one thing, not many things. The issue on earth is the word me. Two letters, M-E. And it can be one letter, I. <laughs> this is the issue, my beloved. Now, if we stop saying me, 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 earth would have been heaven. Can we live heaven on earth? Yeah. When can we live heaven on earth? When the day comes, me is no longer in existence. I can have heaven on earth. I can actually taste, live heaven on earth. I don't need to wait to go to heaven because heaven came to me when Christ came, he brought heaven. But the problem, I entered heaven with me. Because when I enter heaven with me, guess what? Christ says, it's only me. He talks, I talk. He talks, I talk. Problems. Why is the church in division? Because me didn't listen to Christ. The leader did it his way. And Christ was not happy with it. That's why the church was destroyed. It was destroyed, my beloved. The great multitude in heaven with one voice, a great multitude in heaven with one voice saying, Alleluia. This great multitude in heaven with one loud voice, they were saying, Hallelujah. Now, just some very brief explanation about the word Hallelujah. What does it mean when we invoke this word 
Hallelujah. Literally, it means praise Yahweh or rejoice in Yahweh. The word hallelujah means praise Yahweh, glorify Yahweh, Yahweh the I am God, and or rejoice in Yahweh, both praising Yahweh and rejoicing in Yahweh. This is the meaning of the word hallelujah. And Yahweh means literally the I am. I am that I am, which was given to Moses the prophet when God spoke to him through that shrub, that plant. Moses asked him, he said, what is your name? Because I'm sure when I go down the mount at the foot of the mountain, your people will ask me, what was the name of this God that spoke to you? What shall I say? He said to Moses, go and tell them I am that I am Yahweh. Now, it's not our topic, but since we mentioned the name of Yahweh, which is the I am, you will see, especially in the Old Testament, you will see God has so many names. And you will notice also these names are deliberately, purposefully put in that particular verse, in that particular time, for that particular reason. And you will see different names being used at different places in the Holy Bible. I'll give you an idea. When you read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the very beginning of the Holy Bible, Old Testament, Genesis 1 1, it says the following, in the beginning, when you read it in the original text, which is Hebrew, which is Hebrew, when you read it in the original text, it says this, in the beginning, Elohim or Elohim. Elohim, our way of pronunciation. In the beginning, Elohim or Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Why the name Elohim is put here in Genesis 1.1? Why? Why wasn't Yahweh? Why wasn't Adonai? Why Elohim? See? But when you read it in English or Arabic, it says God. It says Allah. In the beginning, God created. But in the original text, it's Elohim, Elohim. Now the name Elohim is God the Almighty. It is the magnification of the singular format. When you magnify the singular format, you are trying to reveal the mightiness of the person. When the President of the United States of America stands and talks, even though he is one, he will never use a singular format kind of a speech. He will never say I, he will say we. Why? Because word I is weak, but we is strong. Why do we use we? Because the position he holds is the most powerful position in the entire world. He cannot speak the language of weakness, yet holding a mighty position. So he needs to speak in a language that is relevant to that position which he holds. We the president. Now when God came to creating things, God is the only being that can create things out of nothing. He is the only one that can create out of nothing everything and he can turn everything into nothing. So when he came to create out of nothing everything, he said, Elohim is my name, for I am the almighty God who can create out of nothing everything. Do not fear. Yahweh, I am the almighty God as far as provision is concerned. As far as creation is concerned, I am Elohim. As far as provision is concerned, I am Yahweh. So when he comes and says to you, I am Yahweh, he is literally saying to you, I am everything you need and everything you lack. When you say, I am thirsty, you will, he will say, I am the living water. He who drinks of me shall never thirst. When you say, I am hungry, he will say, I am the living bread who provides your hunger. When you say, I am lost, he will say, I am the good shepherd who finds the lost sheep. Everything you need and you lack, Yahweh is your God.
and everything that needs to be created out of nothing, I am Elohim. Wow, amazing. Now, Yahweh, the I am. Now the question is here, John the Beloved, he said, this multitude, this great multitude, they were all saying with one voice, Hallelujah. Now the word Hallelujah means praise Yahweh or rejoice in Yahweh. Why didn't John the Beloved write that the multitude with one voice, they said, praise Yahweh. Why didn't he write that? He instead, he put the word Hallelujah, not praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Why? He left it as hallelujah instead of writing it, praise Yahweh. See, if he had written praise or rejoice in Yahweh, this would have meant Yahweh has done something for you and this is why you're praising him and rejoicing in him. You with me? If he had written the great multitude with one voice saying praise Yahweh, now, or rejoice in Yahweh. When would you be happy when somebody has done something for you? When would you praise them when they have done something you couldn't have done it? So what are you going to do? Thank you so much, so and so. Praise this person because they've done something. No, he didn't write praise Yahweh. He left it as hallelujah. Wow. I'll tell you why, my beloved. So if he had written praise Yahweh, that means Yahweh has done something for you. That's why you're thanking him and you're praising him and you're rejoicing in him. However, when you say hallelujah, the praise and the rejoicing is for Yahweh being himself, just being him. See the difference? I'm not thanking you I'm not rejoicing in you. I'm not praising you because you've done something for me. I rejoice in you because it is you. Just for you, I rejoice. Being you is more than enough for me to be praising and rejoicing in you. I don't need you to do anything. I thank you for being you. I thank you for being you. Lord Jesus, I don't thank you for healing me. I don't thank you for making me a bishop. I don't thank you for giving me a high place. I don't thank you for bringing people to listen to your word. I don't thank you for giving me the church. I don't thank you for dressing me up in this outfit. I don't thank you for anything you've done. I thank you because you're Jesus. Yes? Uh -huh. See, my beloveds, we need to approach God totally different. Now I'll come back to the husband and the wife. Let's come back to earth, from heaven back to earth. And we pray by the grace of the Lord, we live heaven on earth. Amen. Now, let's look at the husband and the wife scenario again. The husband goes overseas on a business trip and while the husband is in a foreign country he misses his wife so he calls the love of his life and he says honey how are you i love you i miss you some of the ladies are laughing because they say we never get that from our husband i know what you're thinking of <laughs> so he calls her honey my love i love you i miss you so much Honey, what would you like me to bring you from overseas? Now the wife, this good girl, she says, my love, I don't want you to bring me anything. All I ever want is you. Hello, hello. Shish kebab. I don't want you to bring me Chanel. 
I don't want you to bring me that big white teddy bear with a red heart and a rose in a cylinder on Valentine's Day. I don't want you to bring me anything for my birthday or take me on a secret night out going somewhere in a limo. I don't want all that. All I want is you present in my life. I want my eyes to fall on this handsome man whom this heart has chosen and said yes. Now, when you ask that person, what would you like me to do for you? And the person replies and says, I don't want nothing from you. All I want is you. This is here now, this true, genuine love that comes from the heart. This is exactly how John the Beloved puts it. All this great multitude with one voice saying, Hallelujah. He didn't write, praise Yahweh. Because praise Yahweh means he's done something for you. That's why you're returning the favor. But when you praise him for being him, this is genuine love. I don't want nothing but you. Is this the way we love the Lord Jesus? It's a question for you and me. We need to answer for ourselves. Is this the way we love the Lord? I love you for you, Lord. That's all I want. You. Wow. I'm struggling. I want you, Lord. The Lord comes and says, I'll fix it for you. I don't care, Lord. I just want you. Let the struggle remain. But as long as I don't lose you, let the pain remain. As long as you don't walk away from me, let me remain walking through the dark tunnels. When are we going to learn to love genuinely and truthfully? When, my beloved? Are you going to come back and say, I've done my diligent duty, I've gone to church on a Sunday, I've done it. What else does the Lord want from me? I went to the church, I prayed, I gave my share my tithing whatever it is what else does the lord want let him leave me alone to live my life i've given him what he wants now i want to be free this is not love you don't go to church to fulfill a duty you don't read the holy bible just to say to your conscience i've done it no you go to church because the love of your life is there You read the Holy Bible because this is his voice to you, his word to you. You you fast because everything I do, I do it because I love you, Lord. I love you. And Satan is not leaving me alone, but I love you. you. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is ought to be loved for being Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And all the great multitude with a loud voice saying, Hallelujah. I love you for you, Lord. Not because you've done this. Yet you've done a lot. You've done the impossible. You died for me to save me. But even though you did all this, but I still love you for you, Lord. So the husband calls the wife, calls her. Honey, what can I bring you from this country? I don't want nothing. I just want you back. I miss you. I love you. I want you. Nothing else. Now that is a true, genuine love. Imagine if all of us, in whichever relationship we're in, whether it be parents and children, whether it be husband and wife, brothers and sisters, cousins, colleagues, church, leader and the flock, if all of us acted, behaved, lived in this way, heaven is on earth. Heaven is on earth. But why we are going through hell on earth? Because of me me is selfish me is egocentric me is one way but love true love is two way not one me speaks the language of singularity i i love speaks the language of plural we when the disciples approached the lord jesus and asked him teach us on how to pray what did the lord say he said every time you pray you say our father not my father, our father. So when we come to the church as faithfuls, 
we pray, we say, our Father. But when I go to, to my home and I go into my room and I stand alone by myself, I still say our Father. I don't say my Father who art in heaven. Whether we are many or one, it is always the pluralistic language because the language of love is we, not I. So when you're alone and you pray, don't ever be selfish and pray for yourself. Pray for everyone. Include everyone in your prayer. That is true love. Amen. Very good. Now, listen to this. This great multitude in heaven says, being in God's presence, seeing him before us is more than all things God had ever done for us. It is more than enough. It is more than sufficient just being in his holy presence. We thank you, God, for allowing us this piece of dust, my new piece of dust, allowing us to be in your holy presence. What else can I ask more than what you've done? Just allowing me to be in your holy presence. I thank you for it. Just being in the church. I thank you, Lord. Whether you answer my prayer, my request or not, but by being in your holy presence, this is more than enough for me to say, I love you, Lord. Don't pray. And then if the prayer is not answered, you say, that's it. Lord, you've had your chances. You blew it away. Thank you very much. No, you didn't answer it because in your infinite wisdom, you know when is the right time. You know when to give it, how to give it. I'm asking you in this particular way, but you know this particular way is not good if you give it to me. So I trust in you. I love you. I don't care what you do, what you say, how you do it, when. I don't care. I'll go to hell as long as you're with me. I don't care about the place. I care about you. So why are we complaining? Why are we fighting? Why are you arguing about is there heaven? Is there hell or is there in between? Just forget about all. Focus on Christ. Christ needs to be your heaven. Christ needs to be your kingdom. Christ needs to be your citadel, your family. He is your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your heavenly groom. He is your entire everything you need. Focus on the Lord. So if the Lord decides to take me to hell and he is with me, I don't care. Who cares about the place? Because Christ is my heaven. And wherever I'm with him, I'm in heaven. Even if I'm in hell, I'm in heaven. Love the Lord for the Lord. Love the Lord for the Lord. It is enough being with you, seeing you, my Lord. You, Lord, suffice. The word hallelujah is mentioned for the first time ever in the entire New Testament. You will never see the word hallelujah in the entire New Testament. You will never see it mentioned except in chapter 19 of Revelation. Never ever. Not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the epistles of St. Paul and all the other patriarchs. None of them. The only place in the entire New Testament the word Alleluia is ever mentioned in Revelation 19 verse 1. Chapter 18, the woman is the harlot. Chapter 19, the woman is the bride of Christ, the holy one. Chapter 18, desert. Chapter 19, heaven. Chapter 18, I've walked away from God and I spoke my language. We had all of our voices except the voice of God. Chapter 19, the language of heaven is one loud voice coming from a multitude. But chapter 18, the world is the desert. Chapter 18, the multitudes uh, speak in voices and in voices, your voice is lost. But in heaven, there is only one loud voice because all spoke Christ and Christ spoke through all. Heaven is clarity, holiness, exaltation, standing and sitting in the presence of God. So whenever you go through troublesome times, remember my beloved child, remember this. Everything, and I mean everything and everyone, everything and everyone in this temporal realm everything and everyone changes there is nothing on the face of this planet that remains as it is forever everything and everyone changes my advice now to all of us don't ever don't ever don't ever make a permanent decision on a temporal situation don't ever make a permanent decision on a temporal situation because that decision which you took, which could be permanent, you took it for the sake of a temporal situation that is going to change tomorrow. That's it. I'm walking away. Things could change and then you will regret the decision you made. So if you're struggling today,
day, things are going wrong in your life, on a personal level, on a social level, whichever level it is, remember, it will never stay and remain the same. Because just like chapter 18 was all negative things, it was followed by chapter 19, all positive things. This is the Lord. This is our God, our good God. He will never leave you astray. He will never put you in a situation that is more bigger than you. And whenever the struggle becomes intensified, he will open a vent for you to breathe again. The Lord will always make sure there is one window or one door open in the midst of many windows and doors shut in your face. Don't ever lose hope. Be hopeful. Don't be negative always. Don't be grumpy always. Don't be sad always. Don't, don't be crying always. Cry but laugh. Be sad but also be happy. You may be sick but tomorrow you'll be healed. You may be struggling today but tomorrow the comfort is coming. The Lord is the comforter. What did he say? I'll send you the Holy Spirit, the comforter, to comfort you. Why? Because you're living in a world that is placed in the bosom of Satan. There will be a lot of trials, tribulations, persecutions. But remember, after every persecution, I will come and heal you. I'll come. Don't ever lose hope. Amen.